Well, this morning I would like to uh, continue with our um, um, thrust on, uh, on vision. Uh, we're calling uh, uh, the month of February our vision month, and each Sunday in February is Vision Sunday, where we are uh, discussing vision, we are restating what the vision for this church is. Uh, and just to get started, and I'm just going to briefly recap, and then we'll launch out and cover some more ground uh, to what we've already done so far. But here in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's faith in the good news. And uh, we pointed out that God has called every believer in every local church to rally around the common vision for that respective house or that respective church and use their time, their treasure, their talents to contribute to us to fulfillment of that particular vision. So in God's kingdom, there are no spectators, there's only participators. And uh, if you have missed any of the last two Sunday messages, I'm encouraging you to get online and uh, re-listen to the message, otherwise get the CD. Uh, I'm asking us all to make some commitments for this year uh, and to run uh, to run hard with the vision this year because God expects us to achieve some things, to accomplish some things this year. We restated our mission statement, which is reaching people for God and helping them to become fully devoted followers of Christ. And then we also talked about our goal of each week connecting one family to Jesus and also to the Victory community. So that's a goal that we have, that we believe God's laid up upon our heart. And part of what we're doing with our prayer care and share card, with these little tracts and, and street evangelism, everything that we're doing, go, going into various uh, uh, places to, to, you know, to share the, the love of Christ with people, to share the gospel, is all towards that goal that we are reaching people and then that we're connecting them, uh, helping to connect them to Jesus and helping them to connect them with the family of God here at Victory Christian Center. Last Sunday, specifically, we talked about the five purposes, uh, which uh, we, we came into this understanding back in 2004, and we ran a campaign back then called The Purpose Driven uh, Life, and uh, we talked about the five purposes, uh, uh, number one, worship, number two, fellowship, number three, discipleship, number four, ministry, and number five, evangelism. And uh, it's good for, for those of us that have heard this before to go over it again, and of course, for new people to come into this understanding. It's radically changed the way that we do church as a, as a church here. It's radically changed our lives as individuals now that we understand that God doesn't call these five areas, five options, but five purposes. And uh, this morning I would like to speak to you about the invasion of the Spirit. I had an interesting experience a couple of weeks ago in the pre-service prayer meeting where uh, I just had a kind of a, um, a time where God just spoke to me so clearly about some, some things that uh, he wants us to deal with to prepare for the invasion of the Spirit. God took me to a particular passage of Scripture that I'll be sharing with you today, and it's like while the prayer meeting is going on, I was sitting inside my little bubble, and, and God's just uh, you know, speaking to me and highlighting some things, And because uh, in the meantime, I've uh, put pen to paper and opened the Word and studied the Word along these lines, and, uh, and this message that I'm sharing with you today is all part and parcel of uh, where we're going. You know, we've talked about the vision. We've set the goal. The vision hasn't changed. Uh, uh, we've just restated the goal as to what we are hoping to achieve this year in God. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, the, the focus. That The focus, uh, of course, besides focusing on Jesus, we are focusing on souls. That We want souls to be saved. We're looking beyond our own needs and beyond our own challenges and say we're going to help somebody else to connect with God. And this morning I would like to speak to you about an emphasis that's been there uh, for some time uh, and will continue to be an emphasis on the things of the Spirit, an emphasis on the outpouring of the Spirit, an emphasis of the invasion of the Spirit. And with that, um, I would like to read from Matthew chapter 3, first three verses, then we're going to pray and then we're going to launch out from there. So there it says, a, a number of years later, John the Baptist, by his own witness in the deserts of Judea, announced the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He said to everyone who would listen, change your attitudes and your actions. 
Prepare yourself for an invasion of the spirit dimension which is imminent. For the information of you Jews, the baptizer was forecast by Isaiah, one of our ancient writers, when he said there will be a voice of a person witnessing in the desert. Get ready for the coming of the one who fully embodies the spirit dimension. Clearly mark his way. Heavenly Father, we want to once again thank you for this time, the time of the reading and the proclamation of your word. And we thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, that you're teaching us. Lord, you said that we shall know the truth and the truth will set us free. You also said, Lord, that it is the doers of the word that will be blessed, not those who only hear. And so we commit right now to once again be doers of the word. We declare that our hearts, our minds, our spirits are open to receive that which you're saying to the church at this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 3 uh, speaks about John the Baptist who came uh, to prepare the way or prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. And right there, it speaks again, uh, uh, that uh, similar passage where it speaks about an invasion of the Spirit. And uh, this particular translation that we're reading from just uses those, those, uh, that terminology and those words. Other translations say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here it says, change your attitudes and your actions, which actually means to repent. He says, for an invasion of the spirit or the spirit dimension is imminent. And God's telling us still to this day to change our attitudes and our actions and to prepare for uh, an end time invasion of the spirit. And uh, the preparation required on our part to prepare for that invasion is to change our attitudes and our actions. So in other words, if we're not making any effort in changing attitudes and actions, uh, we're not ready for the invasion of the Spirit. Now, uh, some of us have been Christians for many, many years, and we think, oh, we've done that way back. We've, we've fixed everything. We've changed all, everything that we needed to change. And uh, how many of you know that this is an ongoing deal? Like it just, it's just somehow something else gets highlighted, and the Holy Spirit puts His finger on another area in our lives, and we must not allow ourselves to grow stale um, or to just uh, connect into religion as opposed to connecting to Jesus Christ the person. So this is an ongoing sort of a deal. So no matter where we are in our journey uh, of, uh, of uh, pre-Christian or just become Christians or have been Christians for many years, we need to change our attitudes and we need to change our actions. Hopefully in the latter stages of having walked with the law for many years, it's just a bit more of a fine-tuning rather than sort of major deals. But it's amazing what the Holy Ghost can bring up in our lives. And uh, so this morning, I would like to uh, point out that in terms of the invasion of the Spirit, uh, there's two waves in particular that I would like to speak about. The first wave of the Spirit uh, that's spoken about here in Matthew chapter 3, when that happened, some people were ready and others were not. Have you know that when John the Baptist came to prepare the people uh, for the coming of the Lord, some people responded to his ministry, others did not. But you know, ready or not, the invasion came. And that's the deal. Uh, you know, ready or not, at a certain point, God is going to burst forth and He's coming. And, uh, he, he, and, and God's not waiting for every single person to, to make up their mind and take years and years and years. You know, at a certain point, this deal is going to happen. Jesus came to liberate people through His death on the cross. He established a new government, a spiritual government, this is, and the Spirit was put out on the day of Pentecost. So when John the Baptist came and he says, change your attitudes and your actions for an invasion of the Spirit is imminent, well, it did happen, all right? And that was the first wave. In fact, it's been interesting when I, uh, you know, meditate on that terminology that's being used there. And to mind came the invasion, one of the greatest invasions, in fact, the greatest invasion that ever took place in terms of literal army invading literal country or literal continent. Uh, some of you that know your history of Second World War, they talk about D-Day, when uh, the Allied forces invaded Europe, uh, the continent. And Eisenhower, uh, President Eisenhower and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, General Eisenhower and uh, anyway, I'm getting mixed up here. And Winston Churchill got together, and they decided that we we're going to set a date for the invasion to take place. And you know, an invasion is not to come and hurt people, but it's come to set people free. And uh, on D-Day, um, June the sixth of 1944, the Allied forces invaded Europe, 
the continent, and they came to liberate people from the uh, rogue government that had set itself up, and of course that was uh, uh, Hitler and the Nazi regime, and they came to absolutely decimate that deal and to set the people free. But you know, in the process of them going in there, they, they didn't come to hurt anybody, but they, they had to smash a few things along the way to really deal with things. And you know, when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, uh, in order to really help us, he's got to break some things down and uh, strongholds that have been built up over the years and, you know, deal with, 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 you know, just hindrances and different things to really get this deal going uh, because God has come to set the captives free. And I was just really inspired by that, that this, they reckon, was the biggest invasion in human history where some 200,000 uh, soldiers were activated and uh, some 7,000 ships and uh, somehow floating devices uh, uh, were sitting off the shores of the Normandy on June uh, the 5th. Um, of 1944, and uh, at midnight they dropped down some uh, paratroopers, some uh, parachute uh, soldiers uh, to deal with some things, and at 5.30 in the morning they got going, they bombarded the coast, and then the Allied forces landed on the beaches of La Normandie, and of course the rest is history. And uh, so there's another invasion that's been and gone. And you know, we speak about the invasion of the Spirit. When Jesus first arrived, he sent a forerunner ahead of himself, and that forerunner was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had a ministry, uh, and that ministry was to prepare the way for the Lord. All right, and we know that these uh, forerunners, these uh, paratroopers that were dropped into the co into the uh, along the coast of France at midnight, they were forerunners to deal with some things and to take out some 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 guns and different things. So when the the main deal happened, uh, uh, there was not as much opposition anymore. And uh, you know, we talk about the first wave of the spirit invasion. Uh, it, it happened. Jesus came, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out, and that's been and gone, and it's still happening today. But there's another wave of the Spirit invasion happening, and it is this last wave will be just like the first. Some people were ready, and others were not. But friends, ready or not, it's going to happen. This last day outpouring of the Spirit, it will take place. The ingathering of souls uh, will happen. Jesus Christ will return to this earth and he will set up his throne in Jerusalem. He will set up his physical, literal government on this earth to rule over all of creation. It will happen. You know, some of us that have been around for some years, we remember teaching that we used to receive years ago when they talked about the latter rain. How many of you understand the term, the latter rain? In fact, there's a whole movement to talk about the latter rain movement and everything. And you know, we have, we have chapter and verse that speaks about the former rain and the latter rain. And I want to just read some of those things because these things are still very much relevant today. Um, because the latter rain is basically the last day outpouring of the Spirit that, by the way, has already begun. You know, different parts around the world, different places, they're already experiencing revival. And we're just trusting God now for Western societies to come into greater levels and greater measures of this revival, this spirit invasion that will ultimately usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. So here in Hosea chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. Now that's very interesting here because it's saying that his going forth or his arrival is going, it says, is going to happen or be established as the morning. Well, what's, what's sure about tomorrow morning? Well, one thing is sure, it will happen. All right, the morning is going to come. The night's not going to stall indefinitely. The morning will come. And uh, just like it says here that the going forth of the Lord is established and it is as sure as the morning. And then it says he will come to us like rain. And this is interesting. Because, you know, suddenly you see clouds and then suddenly it rains. And, you know, those who are discerning know that once you see the clouds happening, you know that rain is imminent. And some of us have seen the cloud. We know that the invasion of the Spirit is imminent. And then it'll come and then it'll all just, uh, you know, the rain's going to increase. The next minute there is a flood. And it speaks there about the latter and the former rain. Now, in Israel, and this is northern hemisphere now, they talk about uh, the whole farming cycle, the whole agricultural cycle. They speak about the former rain, and that's typically autumn rains that are coming to soften the ground for plowing and for planting. Autumn 
Over there is uh, October, November. Rains happen. And they soften the ground. And the farmer goes out. He plows the fields. He puts the, the, the seed in the ground. And then there is not a great deal that happens until springtime when you get the latter rains. And those latter rains are then absolutely essential to bring forth an uh, abundant harvest. And God in his wisdom speaks to us about, uh, you know, uses a natural picture of what happens in the area of farming and harvest to bring that analogy across into the realm of the Spirit and it talks about the former reign that took place with Jesus' first coming uh, with the establishment of uh, the kingship of, 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 of God over you know, human uh, over mankind and over human beings. And then it spoke about the outpouring of the Spirit. That's the former rain. And that really, you know, there was a lot of planting. In fact, the Bible also speaks about first fruits. You know, the early church is the first fruits, but we are a part of the harvest coming in now. This is the last end time harvest before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. And, uh, and here in Zechariah, it has another passage of Scripture that speaks along these lines. It says, it says in verse 1, it says, Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give to them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Now what really struck me here is it says, Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. You think, well, if it's the time of the latter rain, surely the rains are going to come forth. Well, not, not necessarily. God wants us to pray. This is now the time for the latter, latter rain. The former rain has already been. The outpouring of the Spirit, the first invasion, the first wave of the Spirit has already happened. It is now time for the latter rains of the Spirit to pour forth and to saturate communities and people everywhere so that people come alive spiritually. And you know, some of the planting that has taken place in terms of sowing gospel seeds, and this church has been very, very active in terms of getting the gospel out there into different places and so forth so that some of these, these seeds will begin to germinate and, 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 and spring forth and bring forth salvation in people's lives and so that people can be harvested and, and ultimately uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ will be ushered in. So interestingly, it says, Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. Frank, can I suggest to you that to, to pray for the outpouring of the Spirit is a scriptural prayer. We, what we're doing is we're saying, Lord, we know that the first wave of the Spirit has already happened. We know there have been outpourings of the Spirit. We know there have been revivals along the way. But we're now praying for the final outpouring of the Spirit before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Anybody that's done any study on various outpourings of the Spirit or revivals, or call it what you like, one of the main ones that comes to mind in recent history is the, is the Azusa Street Revival that took place in 1902-1903 in a street in Los Angeles called Azusa Street. And there were some people there that got together in a converted horse stable and began to seek God and began to pursue His presence and began to cleanse their lives and began to ask God to pour out his spirit and the rest is history that was the revival of all revivals uh, there were so many people that were drawn into, into that place even though travel back then was a lot more complicated and complex as it is today. But so many people were drawn by the Spirit from various places around the world, went to Azusa Street and learned about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which up to that point was, it just people just didn't, didn't know about being baptized with the Holy Ghost. They thought that some of that had passed away, but along with you know, various other things, but, but it hasn't passed away. It's still for us today. And they got baptized with the Holy Ghost, went back to their home country, back to their home city, back to their home church, and the Lord began to pour forth in these places. And today we have got Pentecostal churches all around the world. It all goes back to the Azusa Street Revival. In fact, there was a denomination that, that flowed out of that, and the, the AOG, what we call the Assemblies of God, have got their roots in the Azusa Street Revival uh, in Los Angeles there. And so that was the beginnings of the last day outpouring of the Spirit, and it hasn't finished yet, and we haven't seen everything yet. So to pray for God to pour out His Spirit is a scriptural prayer, because right there, God says, Ask the Lord for rain in the time of rain. And it is time of rain right now. This is the time of the latter rains. 
and we're asking God to pour out His Spirit. We say, Lord, this is the time. Pour out Your Spirit, but not just upon us and upon our little lives and our, our church. Lord, pour out Your Spirit in the communities, over the cities, over the region, over the whole nation, and right around the world. We're getting ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Somebody might say, well, no, 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 it's speaking about uh, grass there. This is just God talking about feeding all the animals and all the, you know, all, all the animals. No, 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 God's, God's, God's speaking about pouring out His Spirit. Notice here in James chapter 5, verse 7, it says, So be patient, brothers and sisters, until the Lord returns, or until the Lord's return. So what's it speaking about? It's speaking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. He says, be patient. He says, think of how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the ground and is patient for it until he receives the early and un, until it receives the early and the latter rains. So what's this talking about? It's talking about that you and I have to be patient, have to be an enduring kind of people, that we're not just suddenly think, oh, it hasn't happened yet, so it's, it's obviously not going to happen. No, no, we just continue on. We continue to serve the Lord. We continue to believe God. We continue to speak the Word. We continue to sow the seeds of the gospel and so forth. It says, think of how the farmer waits for the precious fruit. And there the picture is that God is like a farmer that is waiting for the precious fruit to come forth. The first outpouring, the former rains have already happened. Very much part of God's plan in terms of, of what He is uh, destined and everything. And now God's pouring out his, his, uh, his Spirit again in terms of the latter rain. God is waiting for the precious fruit of souls, of people. And not just once and two and not just dozens or even scores, not even hundreds, but multiplied thousands and thousands and thousands of people to be swept into the kingdom of God. He says, you also be patient and strengthen your hearts for the Lord's return is here. So it's interesting how it's speaking about the Lord's return and it uses the term the latter rain, which is imminent. Invasion of the Spirit is happening, and uh, so it's not something that hasn't like happened before. It's happened before, but there's going to be an increase. It's like God's going to just turn the tab up. And it's interesting, you know, God is, uh, God is speaking to different people in terms of uh, visions, and people are seeing things of, of water being poured out, and, uh, and, and, and people are hearing the sound of rain, and then they go outside, and there's no rain there. And what they're hearing is not physical rain. They're hearing, hearing the rain of the Spirit. Where suddenly, you know, and it's an interesting thing. You know, we watch some of these, uh, these um, nature programs. And, you know, you see some desert somewhere. And you see a picture of desert. There's just sand and, and, and a, few, a few dried up uh, uh, shrubs and things. And there's just nothing there. And then they show how the rain falls and all of that. And there's seed there that's been sitting there in many instances for years and years and years didn't do anything. It was just waiting for the rain. And when the rains come within a matter of days, suddenly the whole place is, it comes alive and there's just, where there was just sand and, and just nothing. There's, suddenly there's growth everywhere. And we could look over our commuters and say, oh man, this place is a mess. There's just nothing there spiritually. This is just dead. This is just unproductive. Just wait for the rains. Because, friend, gospel seeds have been sown into our nation and into the nation around the world for years and years and years, and we haven't yet seen the harvest of what God expects to come forth. God's patient. God's just pouring out His Spirit, and you and I need to be patient. Some of you say, well, I've prayed and I've reached out to my friends and, and family members for years and years and years, and nothing's happened. Just wait for the rain. Just ask now the Lord. In the time of the latter rain, ask the Lord for rain. Lord, pour out your your spirit let the seeds germinate let them spring up let them bring forth salvation and of course the picture that we could bring that across into the parable of the sower where Jesus said that the man goes out to sow and some seed falls on stony ground some falls by the wayside some falls amongst thorns and amongst thistles but others falls on good ground and they bring forth some 30 some 60 and some 100 fold it's amazing how all of that ties together so um, looking at uh, some of the Bible commentaries which I you know, tend to look at to help me with my study and my understanding of, of truth and of Scripture and everything, there's one particular um, uh, commentary that says that it says the latter rain that shall precede the coming spiritual harvest will probably be another Pentecost-like effusion 
of the Holy Ghost. So what the Bible scholars are saying is that that there's a harvest coming. But that harvest will be preceded by another outpouring, by another invasion of the Spirit, and it'll be Pentecost-like in effusion. And this is nothing new, as I say. I mean, we're hearing reports and testimonies all the time from different places around the world. It's just somehow that it's happening in some of the uh, you know, undeveloped nations more than what it is happening in Western nations. But we've got stuff happening uh, in Western nations as well, and there's an increase. There's, a, if you like, a cranking up. And certainly for us, uh, we, we, want, we, we are praying that this thing just increase and we're doing everything we can as a people and as a local church uh, to be ready, that we can accommodate the growth when it comes, that we're not losing anybody, that the, 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 the harvest doesn't go to waste, but that everybody can be trained disciples. Our small groups, our connect groups is all part of that strategy. When people come in, we can invite them in and some of our, our training material, it, it's all ready. It's just all ready. That's why we're talking about leadership training. It's already. Churches have been known to, 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 um, to increase in size, not by just being added to, but multiplication. In some instances, churches have doubled, tripled, quadrupled like overnight when suddenly an outpouring takes place. And, uh, and, and one of the more exciting revivals, and, and it, this is a documented sort of a deal, that in 1949, the Spirit was put out in the Hebrides Islands off the coast of Scotland. And there was a, a minister there by the, na- by the name of... Uh, uh, Duncan Campbell, and he was invited. He was, uh, if you like, an, a preacher, an evangelist, and uh, there were some people in the islands there that said, "What we need is we need a, we need we need somebody to come and preach the gospel to us. We need we need spiritual renewal. We need revival. We want more from God." They were starting to pursue God's presence, and that's what our worship experiences in the evening is all about. We, we, we are beginning to pursue God's presence like never before. We, are crank, we want more of God. Uh, that's what we want. And so anyway, they invited this man and uh, make a long story short, in the end he couldn't come and, uh, and uh, they corresponded with him via letter and so forth. And he said, look, I can't come when you want me. But, uh, but, but then things changed and a few weeks later he did turn up and had a very small little meeting and he began to preach the gospel. And he began to call people to repentance. And there's something about that, my friend, that repentance prepares the way for the Lord. And uh, there is an issue there with, with, with the modern gospel, if we can call it that. There's nobody calling anybody to repentance anymore. And then people sort of uh, come around to things of God and everything, but because they've never fully repented and never been thoroughly converted or born again in a time of adversity, they slip away. And you know, friends, in fact, we'll talk about that in a minute. John the Baptist had one message, and that message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, you know, as it says, change your attitude and your actions for the invasion of the Spirit is imminent. And uh, so let me talk to you about John the Baptist and uh, how he fits in in the overall scheme of things in terms of God's plan for humanity. John the Baptist was the forerunner sent to prepare the way for the Lord. In Luke chapter 1, verse 16, in fact, in the beginning of all four Gospels, It speaks about John the Baptist, and it says here in verse 16, it says that he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. What was the calling on his life? The calling was to make ready a people prepare for the Lord. To make ready a people for that invasion of the Spirit that was about to happen. And uh, he was the forerunner uh, to prepare people for the first wave of the Spirit invasion. Now, friend, let me say that in every move of God, there are forerunners. In every move of God. Not everybody comes on board just to begin with. There are sometimes just a handful of people, a group of people, a, 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 a group of people in a church or a whole church or sometimes a group of church. They're saying, look, we, we, we are now, we're now beginning to pursue God. We're now going to pursue God's presence. We're preparing ourselves. We're ridding ourselves of issues in our lives that we know are displeasing to God. We are now going to make an effort to prepare the way for the Lord to come. Frank, can I say that uh, we are a forerunner church? That we are a forerunner people. 
We are that by the very DNA of who we are as a church. And let me read you again from the Bible commentary here. This one in particular I find very helpful. A commentary critical and explanatory of the Old and New Testament. It says, to make ready, or that phrase there, it says more clearly, to make ready for the Lord a prepared people to have a readiness, to have in readiness a people prepared to welcome Him. Such preparation requires, in every age, and in every soul, an operation corresponding to the Baptist's ministry, meaning John the Baptist. So what that's saying here is that when that invasion of the Spirit happens in order to prepare people in every age, in every move, in every soul, it requires a John the Baptist type ministry that calls people to a higher standard in God, that calls people to repentance and to lay down things in their lives and to, as it were, make it preparatory for the Spirit of God to flow into their lives and uh, to invade their lives and to bring them under this new government of Jesus Christ. Now, th and here's the scripture that God directed me to a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it's a prophecy about John the Baptist here in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through to verse 5, um, is repeated, or parts of it, in all four Gospels. One gospel repeats the whole thing, others just a couple of phrases here. Uh, and I thought I'd go right back to the source to see what Isaiah the prophet saw when he began to prophesy. And he began to say, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the, smooth, uh, the, the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, this is a prophecy, as I've already said, about uh, John the Baptist. And can I just say that, you know, we are the church. We are born again. We're already enjoying the goodness of the Lord, and we're already on our way to heaven. And if, if, if people did not a great deal more than what they're doing right now, people still get to heaven. And, and, you know, if they're born again and walking with the Lord, people still get there. But in terms of preparing ourselves for a great outpouring and even becoming instrumental in reaching our cities and our region, communities all around us, we need to go to a new level. We need to absolutely go to a new level and press through just a little bit further. I say that because I just had a sense in my heart that somebody's sitting here and saying, well, what else is there? Like, I'm already, I'm already a Christian. It's like I'm already... Friend, it's no longer just about you and me in terms of us getting to heaven. It's about preparing ourselves to reach community uh, more so than what we're doing right now. And praise God for everything that's happening. Praise God for everything that's going on already, uh, but there is a new level that God wants us to prepare for. Uh, and, and every time, without fail, God starts with the church, and then God flows out with the believers and touches the community so that surrounds that particular church. And of course, we're not obviously the only church. There's churches right around the church and up and down the country. And God is speaking to churches to prepare for the next wave, which will now be the last wave of the Spirit. We don't know if that wave is going to last two weeks, two months, two years, or 20 years, but we know that the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. The Lord is standing at the door waiting for the precious fruit. All right? And so, interesting, when John the Baptist came on the scene, he was quite a character. The Bible tells us that he was out in the wilderness. He was a, a wild man. He was dressed with camel's hair clothing, which is particularly rough and un, un, um, you know, unattractive, if you like. Uh, he ate wild food. Uh, he was out there in the wilderness. And when he began to preach, people did, he didn't go into the cities I mean, he did, but, but more in the beginning, people came out to hear him. And to everybody he would listen, he, he says, change your attitudes and change your actions for an invasion of the Spirit is imminent. Yeah. You know, that whole deal of repentance, as I said earlier on, sometimes, sometimes, perhaps, sometimes, maybe sometimes, we don't sufficiently talk about the need for a thorough repentance. Some of us that have walked with the Lord for some years, sometimes people say, oh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, Sometimes people don't realize the times that we've spent before the Lord in just, you know, 
tearing things out and, and ripping things out and the, the times of fasting and praying and, and agony and, 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 and weepings and everything just to, to cleanse our lives. And none of us are ever even claiming that we've even remotely arrived. But I know for me, I'm a little bit further down the track than what I was when we first started out. I've told this story before, but uh, I remember that Vanessa and I used to go up to the camps in Waikanae, and we had some, you know, some particular ministries there that used to run an annual camp, and we would get along there and hear the speakers, and mostly national speakers, and just people that in many respects were forerunners. Uh, some of these ministers were forerunners to Vanessa and I, that we looked up to these guys, and uh, still do. Uh, tragically, some of them have gone west now and walked away from the ministry and in some instances walked away from the Lord. It's like, what a tragedy is that? Uh, and I remember being there in one of these meetings and I could, the intensity of the outpouring and, 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 and the invasion of the Spirit into my life became so intense that one afternoon after the morning session, I went out into the fields and I spent an hour out there, an hour and a half or something, and uh, just really dealing with some stuff. And uh, like, really, it's, it's saying... <laughs> Lord, I just, I don't want to be anymore where I am. I want to move on, and I'm giving you this. And if I've helped that back, I'll give that to you. And I'm asking you to take this away from my life and to rip that out of my heart. And I see this and that, and I had a session out there that absolutely changed my life. It's like, and the, the agony in the middle of it all. And friend, there's just, there's just, you know, it's not just like a hop, skip, and jump from the world into the kingdom of God, and everything is sweet thereafter. We've got to dig down in some of these issues. We've got to face up to some sins and to some issues in our lives that things that we see, that we know that are there, things that the Holy Spirit wants to highlight. And there's no such thing as a wholesale repentance. Oh, Lord, forgive me everything I've ever done wrong. Amen. Thank you. And then move on. I mean, praise God, we're forgiven from the time that we walk in. But to get some of these things out of our lives, we need to name them one by one. And each time when they come up again, and it could just be being critical of other people and judging other people, uh, or it could just be being, you know, a gossip and meddling in other people's matters. You know, the Bible over in First Peter chapter 4, it speaks about the fact that judgment begins at the house of God. And just prior to that, it talks about people suffering sometimes uh, uh, for no reason. But he says, let no believer suffer because of evil doing, because of murder or, uh, or uh, uh, being a thief or meddling in other, be uh, other people's matters, busybodies, gossips, uh, people that judge others and so forth. Let none of you, he says, get involved in that. Now, you might say, well, I've, I haven't murdered anybody. But, you know, Jesus brought a higher standard into our lives. When we look at somebody and we hate that person, we've murdered them in our heart. And there's sometimes a, a church is filled with people that have looked at one another and hated one another and have never repented from that deal. Yet we, we're asking God to pour out his spirit. And God says, prepare the way. Prepare the way. So uh, <laughs> I got myself sidetracked there somewhere. So John the Baptist, when, we, when he first came on the scene, they said to him, who are you? Are you the Messiah or are you the prophet? He says, no, he says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John the Baptist had read the scriptures. He found himself in Isaiah chapter 40, where it spoke about him, and he says, this is who I am. <laughs> I thought that was powerful, that the man saw himself in the Word. We see ourselves in the Word. <laughs> Hallelujah. So once again, he came to make ready a people prepare for the Lord's arrival and for the invasion of the Spirit. And we've now got the times of the latter rain. This is the last big outpouring of the Spirit, another Pentecost-like outpouring that doesn't just touch a few believers, but that just touches whole communities, whole cities, whole regions. We have got, uh, we have got uh, reports of this uh, Hebrides revival uh, where when the whole deal was done with, the police were out of a job. There was no crime. All the, all the drinking dens and all the gambling places, everything was shut down. The police had formed a uh, brass band, and uh, because they had no more work, they went around to different churches and different places you know, to join the worship team to provide music because there was nothing to do for these guys. They talk about the Welsh revival where there was such a drastic change that had come into people's uh, lives, you know, in terms of the, uh, the miners and everything. They say that they had to retrain the horses that were pulling these carts out of the mines, whatever mines they were, because these horses were used to hearing swear words all day. And suddenly when the people's lives got cleaned up and their mouth got cleaned up, these horses had to be retrained because... <laughs> well, how about that? 
Isaiah the prophet, uh, under the inspiration of the Spirit, he uses rope-building terminology, and I, th- I thought this was fascinating. When I grew up, there was a rope built just outside of our house, and and uh, was a farm road, and servicing all the farms and all the properties that were uh, from the, my house forward over in, into the rest of the community, and, and our parents, along with other farmers, they had to actually provide so many hours of labor, depending on the size of the property that they had, and so I was too young to work there, but I still remember the whole deal as it went on. It was actually quite a deal, and for a young guy was like having all of these machines and all of these uh, diggers and all of these machines around. That was like exciting. I remember once when uh, they were just doing some preliminary type work and uh, this digger uh, was driving back and forth from our house where the truck had dumped some shingle and took it over, I don't know, 500 meters and I just kept on running after him. I thought this was the most exciting thing, you know, in my, in my boring little life. And uh, anyway, the digger driver in the end felt sorry for me. And so in the end, on the way back, he said, just hop on the back. And so he let me sit on the back and I felt like a million dollars driving on this big machine. I don't know why I'm telling you this story now, but this is the sort of stuff that spins the boy's wheels, you know, like a big machine, you know, like <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Rope building terminology. Um, Asai, Asai employs language here that is normally just used when they build roads. You know, like he uses the word way and highway, valleys elevated, mountains and hills broad low, crooked places straightened, and rough places smoothed out. And this is where God really began to speak to me a couple of weeks ago. It's like he brought all of that to life and gave, gave meaning to this whole thing. Uh, Let me read that same passage here from the New Living Translation. It uses modern terminology to say the same thing. He says, listen. He says, the voice of one shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves. Smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all people shall see it together. And the Lord has spoken. So what it's saying is, is, well, God has spoken. And if God has spoken, it's going to come to pass. All right. He says, he says, the glory of the Lord will be revealed. He says, all people will see it. There was nobody in that place, in these islands there in the Hebrides, that didn't know about the outpouring. Everybody knew it. Everybody saw, you know, talk about Azusa Street. On numerous occasions, the fire engine was called by neighbors because they saw the glory of God on the top of that building uh, that they thought the place was on fire. So they came and walked into the building, tried to clear everybody out, and they said, everybody out, there's a fire. And, and the preacher walked out, he says, fire? He says, there is no fire. And they looked up, and there was the glory of God. It shone like a light. Everybody in that area knew about it. Not everybody was able to interpret it right. But you see, we had it for days, my friend, where supernatural occurrences are just an everyday sort of a deal. Uh, where, where, you know, we're, t- we're talking about signs and wonders. And, and, you know, I mean, praise God for everything that we've experienced up to now. And we don't want to minimize anything. But we are, you know, we are, <laughs> we are stepping deeper and deeper into the river. Yeah. We're going further and further than what we've ever gone before. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I, just, I, I still have those little sessions. One of those that I had out in the field there up in the camp and uh, my little sessions. And sometimes I sit down and God highlights some things. And mostly it's attitudinal things. God says, deal with that attitude. Just let's rip that thing out. You know, the Bible says, the Bible speaks about vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. And, uh, and of course, there's a horrible teaching around that says that some people are just determined to be vessels of honor and other people are determined to be vessels of dishonor. That's not true. Everybody's meant to be a vessel of honor because it goes on to say, if a man cleanses himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor. Yeah. Honor doesn't come easy. We've got to work at it. Dishonor is normal. Uh, it's the norm. Uh, just look around in society. Dishonor. Uh, and, and, uh, and in fact, we've got a very dishonoring society um, in these days. And so these are things that we need to work at um, and deal with in our lives. So the way for the Lord to, has to be prepared before the glory of God will be revealed. 
and the picture there, some of these scholars that read that passage, they, come, they, they, they talk about different things. Some of them refer to the wilderness between Egypt and the promised land, and others refer to that wilderness from up from Babylon when the exiles returned. But one way or the other, some of these areas are very inhospitable areas, uh, and it speaks there about building a highway. Uh, and though some have said that there's a literal highway that will be built, but John the Baptist, under the inspiration of the Spirit, when he came along, he says, I have come to build a highway into the lives of people for them to prepare themselves for the invasion of the Spirit. And we've gone John the Baptist type people today that are again calling people to a higher standard. And, uh, and here it also speaks about that the highway that God is building or the highway for our God is being built as we change our attitude and our action. Each time when we deal with another hindrance, another area in our lives, we can expect a greater infilling of the Lord for God to invade our lives more and, uh, and you know, bigger uh, um, uh, infillings and, and, and all of that. God uses that highway that's being built into our lives to pour out His Spirit into our communities around us. Now, let me just talk a little bit about prayers and intercession. That's huge. God's already told us. He says, in the time of the latter rain, pray and ask God for the latter rain. By the way, have you already joined the prayer meeting when I talked about it last week? I'm asking you to make some commitments. We're doing this deal together. These are not just words. We're talking about a direction that God has set for us. And uh, we're moving forward. We're headed into this. There's no, no uh, spectators. There's only participants. All right. Prayers and intercession for people builds highways into their lives so that the Lord can invade their lives and can in invade their circumstances, their homes, and their situations. And uh, some have already heard the gospel. Others have yet to hear the gospel. But when people come alive spiritually... It is much easier to reach them. They're much more open. In fact, we're finding now testimonies. There's such an openness. We have prayed for our city and our region for years and years and years. It's better now than it's ever been. All right? There is a softening of hearts. There is just a preparedness there that wasn't there before. Now, let me break down, and this is where God really began to speak to me about some things in regards to that road-building terminology. It speaks about the wilderness there. The examples of the contour of the land when he talks about wilderness, desert, uh, mountains, hills, uh, valleys, crooked places. The examples of the contour of the land are references to the condition of our hearts. The wilderness there, wilderness is basically if you take a dictionary and look at the word wilderness, it will speak of an uncultivated region left in its wild and rugged condition. And that, of course, speaks to us of an unbelieving, an undisciplined, and an unforgiving heart. All right? Now, we're talking about generally, of course, uh, you know, unbelievers uh, in many instances don't, don't know any better. Uh, they, they don't believe because they haven't heard the gospel yet, and, and some have heard the gospel and they're still resistant, but with the invasion of the Spirit, their lives will be turned right around. It speaks about an undisciplined, you know, you can get believers with undiscipl undisciplined minds and undisciplined hearts. It speaks there about an unforgiving heart. You can get believers that are filled with unforgiveness in their lives, and God says, get that thing out of your life. Get rid of it. It'll hinder the flow of the Spirit into your life and ultimately into the lives of people around you. It speaks there about a desert. One translation uses the word wasteland, which is dry, barren, and unproductive land. And that speaks to us of a backslidden heart. It speaks to us of an unfruitful life, where life does not produce any fruit. Jesus says that he's called us to, to produce fruit and fruit that remains. It speaks there of valleys, which are not just like gently rolling hills and valleys where one might want to live. We're talking about rope building here and wilderness is where there's canyons, ravines, ditches, and other depressed uh, geography. And that speaks to us of a heart that is stuck in or captured by wrong cultural beliefs and practices. And Frank, can I suggest that cultural norms can absolutely be a hindrance 
for the Spirit of God to invade a person's life if they cling to their cultural beliefs and to the things that they've always known and are unwilling to let these things go. It speaks of mountains. A mountain, and uh, this in some instances a mountain range, uh, is an impassable barrier in the landscape. That's why when we go over a mountain somewhere to talk about a pass over from, you know, from one area into the other area. And those mountains speak to us of a proud and stubborn heart. And we say, oh, you know, our city is filled with people like that. Some churches have got people that are filled with pride and got stubbornness in their heart and will not budge. God says, get that area out of your life. Deal with it. Judgment begins at the house of God. Hills, which is basically raised areas which need to be brought low. And that speaks to us of imaginations and humanistic reasonings that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. God says, cast these things down and bring them into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and verse 5. It speaks there about crooked places. Crooked places in the wilderness. And when we're talking about road building, it speaks there about bends and, and curves and twists. And that speaks of deceit and dishonesty and dishonor in people's lives. Uh, and then it flows on there. It talks about the rough places, which is stony and rocky ground. And that speaks to us of a heart that is filled with strife, gossip, and disunity. In God saying, build a highway for the Lord. An invasion of the Spirit is imminent. And of course, what we understand today is that, uh, that uh, the, the highway doesn't follow the, con the existing contour of the land. The landscape is reshaped to accommodate the requirements for the, for the new highway. Travel up north, they've cut through hills, they've filled in valleys, they, they built bridges over situations, they reshaped this deal. And in the same way, my friend, uh, uh, if we always keep on doing what we've always done, we will only go so far. But if we're going to a new level and we're preparing, we're clearing things out the way, we're getting rid of things that shouldn't be in our lives, we're getting worldliness out, uh, we're just being friends with the world, God says, is like making us our, ourselves as enemies of God. And you know, in the same way as the land is reshaped to accommodate the requirements for the new highway. So God expects our hearts to be reshaped and remolded to prepare for the invasion of the Spirit. I commend many of you who are walking with the Lord and who are walking closely with the Lord uh, and who have made a real effort in cleansing your life. And I commend you for your prayers and I commend you for your dedication to the things of God. Let's keep up the good work. We're doing a good preparation work for God to be able to pour forth like never before. The last outpouring will be bigger than the former outpouring. The latter rains are always uh, bigger, more stronger, and last longer than the former. And, you know, the, the, the former rains were only poured out in Jerusalem on those uh, people there, and then, of course, subsequent outpourings in other places. Uh, but we're talking about a, a worldwide outpouring, and we as a church, we are a forerunner church. We're going to be a part of it. Vanessa and I have said years ago, if God's doing something, we're going to be right in the middle of it. And we will do we will deal with, we will take care of whatever needs to be taken care of in order to be right in the middle of that for God to use us for his glory. And I know that that's your heart as well. So I'm encouraging you. Let's, uh, let's, in fact, let me finally read that passage of Scripture here in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5. It says, Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Then. When's that? When the way has been prepared. When the mountains have been brought low and when the ditches and the valleys have been filled up, when the bends and the crooked twists have been taken out of the way, then the invasion of the Spirit will take place. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see together the Lord has spoken. Bow your heads with me as we close with a word of prayer. And... Uh, and let's take this thing on board. And uh, as, I, as I say, many of you are working. That's the area that you're working in. That's the area where, you know, we believe in God and everything. And we're trusting God that uh, God will take us to a new level. It's not by human efforts that we clean up our lives. It is actually by the Spirit of God. And so God says, in the time of the latter rain, 
ask God for the time of rain. In the time when the last outpouring should take place, God says, ask me for the outpouring. So let's just do that right now. And by the way, tonight in our worship experience, uh, uh, worship experiences are, are there. there. There will be no preaching tonight. There might be, you know, an inspiration here or there, but it, the, 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 the bulk of the time will be dedicated to just worship God and to pursue His presence. I'm inviting you to join in the evening service. Please don't consider these things as optional extras that, you know, you pick and choose like you would in a supermarket. We are flowing together as a local church. We are flowing together as a people. And so tonight, we're going to go to a new level in the presence of God. And as always, the altar is open. And sometimes just coming out of your seat and getting down the front signals to God saying, Lord, uh, my life's open. I'm not a mountain uh, that's impassable. There, there is not a barrier in my life where you can say, God, this far and no further. With us, God, you can go all the way. I wonder if the worship team could just come up right now. We're going to sing one last song. And once again, the altar is open. If God's really stirred your heart this morning with some of the things that I've been sharing, and certainly it's stirred my heart afresh. And uh, I mean, this is not a new message. We've ministered along these lines before. It's perhaps the combination of Scripture that we might use uh, is, is slightly new. And let's just say to God, God, whatever you see in my life that's displeasing, let's take it away. Let's lay it down. Let's, let's get the, the, the rough places smoothed out. Let's get the valleys and the ditches filled in, and let's lower the mountains and get the crooked, crooked places dealt to so that the way for the Lord is prepared for him to pour out his spirit afresh upon our lives, into our church, into our environment, into our community. And then, you know, that that last day um, outpouring doesn't have any barriers or any hindrances. Let's worship the Lord and uh, uh, very shortly uh, we will close, but we have enough time to just uh, respond to God. And sometimes just, just as simple as stepping out of, your, out of your seat and getting down the front and just standing there before God signals to God saying, Lord, I'm one of those. I'm one of those rope builders. I'm one of those that's willing to do what you've asked me to do. Uh, we're not here to tell others what to do. We're only here to respond to it ourselves. And, uh, and tonight, uh, we can have ex extended times in the presence of God. I invite you to join us tonight. God bless you.